All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jennifer Dill. I am the director of the Transportation Research and Education Center here at Portland State University. And welcome to today's uh, PSU Transportation Seminar. I'll be introducing and moderating today's seminar. Our PSU Transportation Seminars have been a tradition since the year 2000. Though today's seminar is virtual only, these seminars are often held live on Portland State University's urban campus, where I am right now, located on the ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, and Wallala bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important that we acknowledge that we are here because of the sacrifices forced on the indigenous ancestors of this place, remember these communities and honor their legacy, lives, and descendants. Today, we are very pleased to have with us Nicholas Smith, who is presenting on transforming commercial arterials into bicycle highways using count data. Nicholas is a nat native Montrealer who loves walking and cycling all year round, regardless of weather. He is passionate about the power of data to support better cycling and walking infrastructure. Nicholas, um, in his role with EcoCounter, helps governments and groups design county programs that lead to actionable insights for programs, projects, and plans that support active transportation. Before we get on with that, I'm going to highlight a couple upcoming events. Um, next week, uh, we have another PSU transportation seminar virtual uh, featuring Dr. Tara Goddard from Texas A&M and proud PSU alum uh, talking about transportation safety culture, where we are and what it means. Uh, the following week, uh, we have a NITSI webinar um, from two colleagues at Oregon Institute of Technology about improving recreational trail accessibility with a volcanic ash treatment. So hopefully some of you can join us for those. Quick overview of today's seminar. Um, so the webinar and the recording and the recording and the slides will be posted on our Trek website um, afterwards. That's a common question we get. Uh, this has been approved for one credit hour of AICP professional development and can also um, be self-submitted to any accrediting body. Uh, the presentation itself will last about 40 minutes, followed by Q&A, and we ask you to type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can type them in at any time, um, and we'll um, share them with the speaker at the end when um, he'll answer them. If we run out of time, we do share all the questions with the speaker, um, providing them an opportunity to respond if necessary. We have enabled closed captioning, but you must click on the CC feature on your control panel to view them. And I think that covers all of my uh, logistical things. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Nicholas. All right. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for that warm introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, great. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nicholas Smith, as Jennifer mentioned, and I work at EcoCounter. So we sell bicycle and pedestrian counters. We can get cars and all kinds of other users, canoeists, skiers, and so on. Um, and then we also do data analysis. Um, we have a data services team that can do all kinds of fun and interesting studies. And so today I'm going to show you um, some of the work that we did here in Montreal, where we're based, um, on, on how we sort of how the city changed the street um, in interesting ways to make it sort of more active and more pleasurable to be at. Um, so this, this street here um, is called the Brev. And so we're just going to move on to the next slide. So um, we're just going to talk a little bit about the, the background here of what the street was like, the context of it. And then the project, which is the Rezo Express Below, which is the REV, or it just sort of means a, a quick, uh, a good express network. Um, and then what were the results? And then sort of what happened with those, like who was using it and how did usage change? Um, so um, fun background. 
Um, so Montreal, we're situated in Canada, near the northeast of the US. Um, we're a big cycling and pedestrian city. Um, there's an awful lot that goes on. Um, you can see that during the pandemic, we closed a bunch of streets during the first year. Um, this street is Avenue Mount Royal. Um, and this was done all summer from like June until September. Um, that's about how the longest we could say our summers last year. And um, you can see it was sort of closed off. People could uh, bike, but very slowly. Um, we eventually sort of changed that so that, uh, you know, you can see the person who has to walk their bike, but eventually we changed it. So you could sort of ride your bike, but very slowly. But there was a lot of activity. There was a lot of interest. People were outside in space, but you had businesses. There's a lot of these patios um, you can see on the sort of right side. There are these restaurants that set up stuff. So it's, it's a really fun atmosphere. Montreal really opens up after a long winter. Um, but this was even more so is sort of the first time that we closed off about a dozen streets uh, in the city to cars and opened them up to pedestrians and cyclists. Um, and you can see it was just a lot of activity. Um, and this contrast to, as I mentioned, our hard winters, um, it really does does get a lot of snow. It's actually snowing right now, um, but uh, people still continue to cycle and walk because um, you can't just not, you can't just shut her in your house for months on end. Uh, so you have to make the city attractive to people all year round. Um, we have about 1.8 million people in the city. The metro area is about four and a half million throughout the, all the suburbs. And we have 560 miles of bicycle network. So it's a huge, huge network, almost a thousand kilometers uh, for those who prefer metric. Um, and Montreal has, has been one of those big cycling cities that has a large network, but it is in the last decade expanded a lot and also built more comfortable networks of protected cycling networks. So now a quarter of the network of those 560 miles is physically protected in some way, whether an off street uh, path, a multi use path um, or an on-street protected bike lane. Um, and importantly, as I mentioned, we have this winter, uh, this long winter, but we do plow our bike lanes in winter. Um, just like we plow the sidewalks, you have to be able to get around. We tend to get about seven feet of snow a year. So you do have to plow it or people won't use it. But when you do, people do end up using it. Um, and Montreal has bought a number of counters from us. They have 56 um, as of last count at the end of the year. Um, and they're always looking for more, some bicycle counters, some pedestrian and some other. So they get a lot of data from this and then they can use that to plan and map out what they wanna do uh, with their street network. Um, so the street that we sort of studied in this case is called Saint-Denis. So Saint-Denis was this uh, old sort of streetcar suburb. It was built just a few miles from downtown um, and uh, it was sort of built early. Um, developers built it. Um, you got a lot of sort of changes, but you had a lot of these these uh, two, three, four story buildings, some apartment buildings, some duplexes, triplexes, um, and some businesses as well. Um, there was a streetcar, um, as mentioned, uh, but you have a fair amount of density, a lot of people who can support activity. Um, and you can see in the winter, things were, were still going on, the snow piled up. Um, but then things changed. Instead of being that street where people were out and about and doing stuff, um, it turned more into an arterial, as, as we saw in a lot of North America in the 50s and 60s and so on. Um, so it became a fast-moving street, a lot of cars, and they used that to go to the suburbs that were built even further out and further and further. Um, and it became less and less a place where people wanted to go. Um, this is what it looked like when I was sort of in my teens and 20s, and I didn't really tend to go to the street because it wasn't very inviting. Um, there just wasn't a great place to be, even though it had nice buildings, it had nice trees, just the number of cars that came by during the times I'd want to go places weren't fun. Um, and it just sort of continued like that. There just, even though there were a lot of people around, you can see um, it's just four, it's a six, six lanes, two parking lanes, four travel lanes, and just a lot of traffic. So the city was like, what are we going to do to change this? 
Um, so they created an action plan. The plans in French, as, as most things are here. Um, but um, the city, and we have boroughs as well, and we have business improvement districts and residents who all got together and figure out what can we do to improve this street? What can we do to make it better and nicer and more inviting? Um, and particularly, not just for residents and visitors, but also for business owners, because business owners are often ones who are likely to say that uh, you know, bike lanes are going to take away parking, they're going to take away people. So how do we create something that is going to be good for everyone um, and help help increase traffic for those businesses so everyone can be collaboratively on board? Um, so we did a bunch of or the, the study, which was the city that did this, um, did a bunch of things. They suggested some public spaces. Um, having a little tax break for non-residential, so commercial businesses, some digital support um, to try to attract people and sort of show off what there was. Um, the Rezo Express Velo, which we'll we'll talk about in more detail, um, this this sort of bike lane. Um, Mid-block crosswalks, so these are long blocks, and so that's obviously important. An update to zoning, a lighting plan, a public art corridor, so um, that's one thing that's really big in Montreal is, is public art. Um, and then having gardens and a different gateway enhancements, so really sort of like signage, making it a nice place, uh, lighting, all kinds of stuff, but also you know, also financial matters and so on. Um, there was a door-to-door -door consultation. So they talked to people, residents and businesses, and they went around. Um, and uh, this was the city and the borough. They did this for business owners. They did this study and it cost $1.2 million over two years. Um, so it's it's an awful lot of money, um, but it's a large street. I think it's six, six, seven kilometers long or so. It's about four miles. Um, so a lot of people that go into it, this is a major commercial arterial and, you know, you have to spend money to be able to know that you have an understanding of what the needs are. Um, so in that part of the, the study, they did some professional services to business owners, um, trying to increase or decrease the number of vacant shops, um, because obviously that's uh, a big problem when there's vacancies that leads to more vacancies, but when it's full, it leads to more other businesses being full. Um, and then trying to deal with online shopping, which of course has been a thing in the last decade, taking away from brick and mortar stores. And then that sort of branding promotion events that I talked about earlier, just to, to make sure that people were willing to come. So the REV, as we call it, um, what is that? So um, Montreal didn't want to just have bike lanes. They wanted to create a bike network, um, which means that the lane had to connect to places. But also, if you want to go a long distance, you want to have a high quality cycle lane. Um, and to do that, right, to get a lot of people biking, you really need not these sort of thin four foot each direction lanes, but you needed comfortable, nice uh, bike lanes to increase bike share. And so um, Montreal set a target for 2027 um for 15 percent of mode share to be cycling and i think we're at around five or so now there are some neighborhoods that are up to 15 percent mode share for cycling others are much lower and so it was not just like some of the areas that were were maybe best for biking that needed these treatments but the whole city so you could get around really anywhere um so this was the the network of this high quality cycle network 150 miles 15 miles of protected bike lanes on 17 routes that would be all year round and would have a four foot standard width um so you can see on the map where it says montreal that's the downtown um and then the the sort of light red that i think you can probably see on the screen this thing that goes from the right to the left that is the saint denis corridor so that was the first one that they wanted to sort of put in place on this large commercial corridor um so we're going to be talking about that in particular, when I say the rev, generally I'll meet that street. Um, but you know, know that this was part of a whole network and it is still being built out um, as we talk. I think about half of these are done right now. Um, so there's still always more work to do. Um, so yeah, you can see that's the corridor we're going to talk about. Um, 
So to see this transition, we have, um, this is just sort of a standard uh, image that shows what percent of the streetscape was advocated to different users. And so including parking and driving, that was 70% for cars. And there is a bus route on here, although because it's right um, on top of a metro line, uh, the bus doesn't run very frequently. Most people are, who are taking transit here are coming via metro. Um, and then the sidewalks take up 30% of the space. Um, and so after adding, you know, in, in this situation, you know, we have uh, some parking, we have two travel lanes and um, adding two unidirectional protected bicycle lanes. So that, that was the goal, keep parking because that's really what businesses wanted, remove the travel lanes, cut them from four to two, and then add these unidirectional bike lanes. Um, and of course, since we have limited space, you know, there were there are options and you have to make difficult choices and it's all about trade offs of how you want to use your streetscape. Um, so there were opportunity to add pocket lanes for turning right and uh, for turning left, they limited the number of left turns you could make and this would reduce the number of turns across um, across the bicycle lanes. Um, the right lanes as well, like a lot of these uh, turning movements also are regulated so that they are only green when the cycle lane is red. And so that differentiation uh, keeps them separate and reduces the amount of temporal contact that you're going to get. Um, as I mentioned before, we have these mid block crosswalks. Um, so you can see one right here. This is in the image is right in the middle of the block and they have a traffic light for that. Um, so this is what it looks like now. Um, so we have like median refuge islands. In this case, there's no um, traffic light at the crosswalk because the traffic is reduced. We have these very wide lanes on, um, for bikes on each side, and we've narrowed the travel lane runway from four lanes to two. Um, and so that just sort of decreases the amount of distance that people have to cross, decreases the number of cars potentially that are in the area, and just makes it a more pleasant place to be. And you can see that from before when we had 70% of the roadway um, dedicated to cars and the occasional bus, we've now dropped down to 31%. We have space dedicated for bikes and we have a lot more space dedicated for people walking as well. Um, and then here is a great Sort of side by side view of of those changes, and it, it really does does make a difference. Um, we can see that um, in 2018, again, this is the actual percentage of use of how many of the you know so these these top horizontal bars here are the percent of the roadway space that is allocated to each use. On the bottom in your circle pie chart is the percent of users of the space. So we have 25% walking, 4% cycling, and 71% driving. That was in 2018. And after the changes, uh, driving reduced from 71 to 60%, cycling more than tripled from 4 to 13%. Um, and walking increased slightly uh, from 25 to 27 percent. Um, so, you know, you can see that the change in your built environment is going to change how people go about that. Um, so we have some really nice photos of this width. So you can see these people biking, but there's enough space to pass people in the spike lane. Um, it's protected by concrete or by these plastic bollards and usually by parking. Um, you'll see the speed limit sign up here says 40, that's kilometers per hour, so it's about 25 miles an hour. So even though uh, this was a big four lane arterial, uh, four lanes of travel lane arterial, it did actually not, it's not meant to be speeding. And so uh, our, our standard citywide speed limit maximum is 50 kilometers an hour, which is about 30 miles an hour, um, and it does go down. So this has been determined that 40 is the correct uh, speed, not, you know, more 25 miles an hour is the correct speed for this kind of street. Um, and that just sort of slows traffic down and it makes it less likely that you're going to get crashes and also um, less likely that people are not going to want to go there because cars are just going too fast and that's unpleasant to be around. Um, we do have um, pedestrian prote or, um, cyclist protection with these islands here in the street. Um, they are not in the intersection, which is something I, I wish was personally was there, um, but it does help increase the 
uh, visibility of the cyclists who are waiting at the lights or passing through the lights from people who are trying to turn um, across. Um, in this case, you'll see they can't actually turn across. Everyone's required to go straight. And like I mentioned, the reduction of the number of turns you can do is, is a common feature of the street. Um, as well here, um, every um, drivers cannot turn, um, but cyclists can turn. Um, you may see there's a little underneath this, this um, one-way arrow sign. It says, accept a uh, and there's a little bicycle logo. So bicycles are allowed to go in all directions, which you can see from the arrows on the pavement. Um, so it actually sort of opening up uh, movement um, for those walking and biking and limiting movement for those driving. And that does help uh, change the context of that. Um, as well, I'll just mention that this is our bike share system, Dixie. It's been around since 2009, I believe. It's one of the largest in the world, but definitely larger, one of the largest in North America. Um, and we'll we'll see in a minute, but it does not does not run in the winter. They take it out because we get too much snow. Um, but people still bike in the winter. Um, but that does affect the ridership because a lot of a lot of usage. I think over the warmer months, we get about forty five thousand people uh, trips per day. Um, you'll also see that like the street was opened up to um, really make it comfortable for everyone. This is really an all ages and ability street, and it's very common to see children, parents, uh, babies, all kinds of um, you know seniors as well. Um, they definitely use the street um, because it's it's nice and comfortable. And I can say definitely that you did not see this before um, when it was just four travel lanes for cars. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned, um, these street, these lanes are cleared uh, in the winter. Um, you know, you can see there's a fair amount of snow. We get a fair amount of snow and ice, but they are cleared. They're salted. Um, and so people are able to continue using them all year round. And they do. And I think the last I had seen about 15% or so of people um, who are biking in the other months are biking in the winter. So that number has gone up as the percent that will continue going. And the goal of the city is to continue increasing that number so that you make a network that is able to be used 12 months of the year. Um, so um, we have some, what, what data sources did the city look at and what did we look at? So um, this is, I mentioned the city has 56 counters. So this is a map of all the different counters that they have. And this is one of the standard products that we at EcoCounter will provide um, for clients if they want to purchase it. Um, and it has, you know, all the data, of how many trips there are, and you can look at it by year, by month, um, you know, by week and so on hourly there's all kinds of data with that but this sort of shows an overview and there's there's a lot of this in the more sort of central area um as well as along um along the saint denis corridor that they were looking at um the city of montreal has an open data portal as well so anyone can download this data you can download it as well it's all available in csv format and that sort of gets facilitated through our api into their system and so there are a lot of, sort of private groups that did data analysis with it and the city does stuff and then we also um, do analyses as well um so one of the the services used was a 2018 um, short-term count um, so this um, was that they would count at certain intersections or certain street segments, um, you know, for a week or two, and then use that to extrapolate to try to find ADT. Uh, some people might say you shouldn't call it AADT because the short term count, you can't necessarily get annual averages with good enough reliability, um, but you can definitely get some sort of guess as to how many people you're getting throughout the year if you can compare these to um, full year accounts. And so that is some of the, the work that we did and that we did for them um, is taking a short term count and comparing those to permanent counters that are there throughout the entire year um, and extrapolating that across. Um, and because biking in particular, but also um, walking is very seasonal and very related to the weather, um, it is really important that you have that ground truth of full year um, counters and counting and so on. So you can see how it gets adjusted. And it's not just environments um, with like big cold winters like Montreal. Uh, you can have rainy seasons, you can have very hot summers, um, but it does, you know, you have tourism season. So it does vary a lot. And so you want to be able to compare your data, um, you know, from, from month to month and week to week all throughout the year. 
Um, and so these are some of the, the charts and stuff we put together and infographics comparing hourly profiles, weekly profiles, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and I'm not going to go over all this data, but this was from an earlier report pre-pandemic that we did uh, and before they did the project. And that's another thing that's really important is that before you do something, if you can get that data, you can show the before and after changes, which is how we were able to show that before. Um, so what were the results after we did this, once we take in the old data and look at the new stuff? Um, so we're going to compare uh, some of the routes. So the black route here is the rev on Saint Denis, that's the big corridor, and then the blue and the green routes are other corridors where they had other cycle facilities, well, well the black route didn't. Um, so those were sort of the blue and the green were the main north-south corridors in this area. Um, and so we had uh, the city has counters at these three locations. Um, and the important part about choosing this is because this brown line here is a train line, and that really does sort of separate the neighborhoods. Only a few streets cross it. And so because of that funneling, you're able to make sure that you count people crossing through. And that's a lot better than sort of getting it at just sort of any sort of random street. So trying to pick strategic points where you know you're going to get most of the people going from one part to the other um, was a useful way of comparing like data to other like data. Um, and this is something that we can help uh, that we help clients with as well to sort of suggest good sites and create a counting plan that will give you useful results. Mm -hmm. So this is what happened. Um, so you can sort of guess probably when the rev came in, it's right where the black started appearing. Um, because the street was so inhospitable before, um, it was basically a rounding error. You can't see it in the 2020 data. Um, and note that even during the pandemic, you know, we had still a large number of people biking per month um, on the blue street and the green street um, because, you know, people were still getting around. But as soon as we opened the road, suddenly the number of people jumped. Now, of course, it didn't jump right away because you can see January 2021, uh, that was a uh, very cold season for Montreal and B, the beginning of Omicron. And we had some very severe shutdowns here, um, curfew at eight o'clock and so on, that did depress um, usage, but you can see it shot up. And um, as, as we often hear about induced demand, we really did induce demand here um, in that the other streets had a very similar number of users beforehand um, as after, and all this traffic just sort of appeared as people said, oh, this is a possibility for me to do my trip. Um, and so this is another way of looking at it. You can see that uh, the green went down a little bit, the blue so it went up or stayed the same, but the Black Street, the ramp we're talking about, really did just out of nowhere, a lot more users um, started using it. Um, a total of 80% over these three streets uh, increase um, in the year that they did it. Um, and so, you know, we can see the profile, the hourly profile here. Um, and so this is post, um, post implementation for both of these charts. Um, and you can see how there's a, um, a usage, obviously, during the weekdays, um, there was a lot of, of usage um, during rush hour, but there's also a lot of usage midday, a lot of usage in the evening. So people were definitely using it um, during the evening. Um, we had a 35% increase on the AM peak and a 20% increase in the PM peak. Um, but uh, just from 2021 to 2022, so that's first year into second year, um, but we also had increases in the other parts of it, um, and as well on weekends. Um, and of course, again, that black traffic just sort of appeared out of nowhere because people decided it was useful. And so you can see there, there was a lot of usage on the weekend as well. Um, this is something, you know, businesses are happy to hear. Um, you know, peak hour travel is often people going to work. Um, but other travel, midday, evening, weekends, sort of kind of things, people are probably coming to stop and use the businesses. Um, so looking at the before and after, you can get some, inf you know, interesting information by looking at sort of the superficial data, but you can dive down into it even more. Um, <clears throat> so um, we can try to look and understand, you know, who's commuting and who's riding for leisure, right? And it's not always going to be true. We know that the stereotype of people working nine to five, those people around those times are going to be um, 
uh, are, are, are going to be uh, biking to work and then other people, maybe they're not. But of course, people do go to work at other hours and people also are going to, you know, go to parks and go to businesses and so on during uh, during peak hours and during other hours. Um, so we can look at what happened during the weekdays and the weekends in particular. Um, and then we'll see that um, just on the Saint-Denis Street, so this is only that one corridor, uh, we had a change of 320% increase um, from the old inhospitable street to the new one. Um, there was a lot of increase in the peak hour, but there was increase, as I mentioned, other hours. And then for the weekends, we had a 470% increase. Um, and it's interesting to look at looking at the weekdays. You can see that sort of we just scoped up mostly everything. Um, you know, the the non peak hours increased a little bit more percentage wise than the peak hours. Um, but the graph sort of looks fairly similar. Um, but you can hardly almost see the increase in the afternoon on the old um, black bar for the weekends if you look on the right. There was an increase, but it was very small, but you can see a massive increase for what we're going to presume are leisure trips, going to events, going to businesses, and so on, um, on the weekend. And so you can see that if you design your streets for um, that sort of commuting kind of person, then you're going to get a small number of people doing it. Um, they will be reliable, but it will be a small number. So you're going to increase your number of commuters but you're really going to increase your leisure traffic um, during all these other times. And that is what businesses um, are really looking out for, um, as well as, of course, you know, residents who aren't maybe the, the kinds of people who, who want to commute in a, on a, a car heavy street. <clears throat> um, now, of course, there are a lot of talk about cyclists, but you can also see what happened to the pedestrians. So um, pedestrians were fairly consistent. There was a 6% increase in walking trips, trips on the weekdays, and that was largely uh, in that sort of midday period when some shops are opening. So maybe people can are more likely to go on their lunch, go to a restaurant or, or something like that. Um, and then on the weekend, we also had that midday increase of 16%. Um, and so it's good to show that, like, of course, people who are walking could have arrived by transit, they could have arrived by bike, they could have also arrived by car. Um, but, you know, if you want to go into a business, you have to, if you come in a vehicle, you have to get, get off or out of your vehicle and walk around. Um, so it's good to see, you know, people who are in business want to see how many people are walking past my store. It's good to say that after these changes, there was an actual increase, an overall increase in the number of people walking by your store, regardless of how they got there. Um, so that's a really important thing, again, to show the before and after, and you can show, no, no, like this, this change did actually help. Um, and then for cars, um, what happened here? So because of the sample size, some of this data is estimated, um, but you can see that car trips dropped during the weekdays, uh, in particular, the largest percentage drops, as you can see, are during those peak hours, um, because you took away two lanes. It just makes it a little bit more difficult to come during those peak hours. Um, but you can see a mixed uh, opinion during the weekends um, in that you actually see some, some sort of increase because the numbers are overall lower. And you see a much closer relation between the weekdays on the blue line and the weekends. You see a consistent, more consistent pattern throughout the day. And so you can see the old black line really does look like what a kind of arterial commuting street is designed to be. And the new blue line is a street of all day, every day kind of street. And so you're really going to get more people um, who are likely coming to come and park their cars and go to businesses. And this rather than people who are just going to drive through fast and not stop and then also make it unpleasant for people who are stopped and walked and going around to see your businesses. So it really does, uh, it's important not just to look at how many vehicles, how many cars are there, but when are they there and what are they doing there? Are they contributing to the vibrancy of the street or are they taking away from it? Um, and so looking at how this changed, um, we have the old numbers of number of people walking, bicycling, and driving. So we had a 9% increase for pedestrians overall, a 250% increase for people biking, um, and a 17% decrease for those driving. Um, 
And if you want to do the math, you can add it up. And it turns out that the difference between the before and after for all total users is about 0.15%. Um, so that's definitely within the rounding error. I'm not going to say that any of this data is accurate to that degree. So you can basically say that the total number of users coming through were about the same before and after, even though you took away uh, you, you took away half of the car lanes, you had only a small decrease in cars and you had an overall even uh, number of users over all modes. Um, so you really can change change the environment and you will see uh, differences in who's there and when they're there and so on. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean you'll see a decrease in the total number of users. You may see an increase or you may see that it's just flat. Um, and of course, remember that 2021, 20, 2022 was during the pandemic, 2018 was not. So the fact that you're flat, even though you have fewer people going out overall, and you also have four more years of online shopping, um, really does show a difference in how resilient the street was. Um, so this is that chart of just showing how equal it is. We sort of kept the throughput um, uh, basically as it is, but we changed who um, those users were. Um, and then here are some sort of key figures. So, you know, as I mentioned, we went from 4% to 13% bicycle mode share. Um, but like I mentioned, obviously a lot of people are not going to want to bike in the winter. So you do see a huge seasonal variation here. So um, during the summer, 20 to 25% of the users on the street are biking. That's just biking. A lot of people are walking, obviously, as well. Um, so the fact that you, we don't have bike share here and the fact that a lot of people aren't going to bike in the snow or the cold or the ice um, just shows that if you take that away, definitely in a city like Portland, but a lot of places um, for a large part of the year, you can do really well in enticing people to come to an area um, on bike or on foot um, if you just make the investments to make that safe and comfortable and reasonable. Um, a 10% increase in walking mode share, and like we mentioned, that 17% decrease in car mode share. Even though you cut the lanes in two, it did not uh, cut the traffic in two. It only cut it in one-sixth. So the same amount of throughput before, a huge increase on um, cyclists both weekdays and weekends, um, which is what business we want to see. Um, and one of the best ways you can see how many stores you have on this segment, and there were 37 new stores in the middle of the pandemic compared to pre-pandemic after this happened. So if people are trying to say that businesses are going to close, well, net businesses actually opened on the store. So this is actually a good revitalization strategy for this street. Um, so this chart uh, is something that you don't see in a lot of studies, but the city of Montreal was willing to purchase uh, sales data. So they purchased this from point of sale. So you know every time you swipe or tap your card um, at a store, that data gets collected by the credit debit card companies. Um, and so they were able to look at all the businesses um, on this street, Saint Denis in red, and then Saint Laurent, which is in black, um, which was one of the the main shopping parallel streets that's about seven blocks to the west. Um, so, looking at what happened throughout the time, and this is sort of normalized for 1.0 being exactly, um, you know, what it was at the beginning of 2019. Um, so. And as we start, you know, the streets sort of tracked each other. They did similar amount of um, business as they did before. They increased at the same time, decreased at the same time. Uh, and then, of course, March 2020, we had a huge drop off. And so these gray lines um, show sort of some of the, the biggest doldrums of the pandemic. And when we had uh, more severe restrictions on when businesses could open and when people were going out. So obviously, both streets saw a large drop off during that time. Um, they recovered and so on a bit. And then um, as you go through 2020, it's sort of, again, fairly up and down. Um, the blue line shows when the rev was open. Um, and then immediately afterwards, as I mentioned, you had the winter, you had this large drop off. But afterwards, you can see that the red street, the Saint Denis, the one with the rev, recovered much better once the reopening started. And this was sort of a partial reopening, this light gray here in February, onto the summer when we had a sort of full reopening. Um, and you can see the street did much better than 
the comparable parallel street that is sort of more longstanding and had been um, a good street for a while. So that fact that at the August 2021, we're already at 95% of the original um, pre like uh, pandemic um, business or whatever compared to 70% for the comparable streets showed that, you know, showed these businesses that it really was a shot in the arm. Um, and so sometimes you really do have to go in and collect that data and getting one business or two businesses to show their receipts and say, this is what happened to me. Looking, that can be interesting anecdotes, but looking at the entire corridor and knowing you have the entire data set of all these different businesses, essentially, unless they don't accept credit cards or debit cards, um, you can get a pretty good holistic idea of what happened. Um, so I think that that was really useful and it was nice that they can do that. And um, sometimes city tax departments will be able to have that data. Um, if you have sales tax, you have meals tax and so on. So you can sometimes grab it from there. Sometimes you can get it from the card operators as well. So that's a, a good data source to, to access. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. We hit just about 40 minutes into this. Um, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is also, um, you know, one of the places right near my house. I love biking by here. And this is one of our displays showing how many people went by. Um, but I think, um, this was really, really interesting study that we were able to do and just show sort of like a lot of the things that I hear people talking about in the planning space is, oh yes, we want to do this, but how do we get people on board? And, you know, sometimes it takes some convincing, it takes some hard work, it took a few years for the city to do this, um, but they were able to do it, they were able to push it in during obviously difficult circumstances globally, um, but the results really do speak for themselves, um, and now people can't imagine going back to what it was. So yeah, I, I want to thank Trek for, for allowing me to do this talk, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, as we go along. Great, thank you so much, Nicholas. Uh, we have uh, several great questions. I'm going to do them in, uh, not in order because there's some that are related to each other. So I'm organizing them. And I'm going to deal with um, uh, sort of maintenance issues first. And so um, we have someone viewing who I assume is in Anchorage, Alaska, because they mentioned that. And we heard you definitely plow the lanes. How do you mm -hmm. deal with the removal and storage of the snow? Like, Oh, yeah. Well, so um, Montreal spends more money on snow removal than any city in the world. Uh, and they have been doing this for a long, long time. Um, I saw a picture recently that showed that 100 years ago, they just plowed it into the middle of the street. And then there was the only way go to get by was on the sidewalks and you just didn't drive for three months of the year um, or didn't use your horse and sleigh, which was what, what you could see in the photo. Um, but the way that they actually remove it, they do pick it up. So we have snow blowers, uh, which are like a unit that you can attach in front of um, some sort of tractor or, you know, heavy, heavy vehicle. Um, and we we, you plow the snow into a sort of column like a Toblerone in the middle of the street and then you just run the snowblower along and you shoot it into a truck and then the truck just drives off and it either they dump it in you know sort of empty areas empty parking lots and fields and so on um, or they put it into an area where they melt it and then it all gets treated um, and then discharged into the river um, and I think the city spends something like 150 million dollars a year um, doing the snow removal operation and they do maybe eight or ten of them a year where they they pick up and it takes about four or five days to do the entire city um, it's a really really big operation but with seven feet of snow in such a dense urban environment there aren't you know um, ditches and and large lawns and other stuff where you can just sort of dump the snow so you know, it's either you'd have to shut her in for three months and just not have any cars or biking at all and just walk around or this this is what they develop. Um, and there are, you know, there are sidewalk plows as well to plow the street and there are now bike plows as well. We've invested in that. It's taken some time, but that's why we're getting more and more of these lanes be um, cleared out. So yeah, if you ever come to Montreal in the winter, you can definitely see it, or you can find, there are lots of videos on YouTube, Montreal Snow Collection or something like that, I'm sure you can find it. All right. So what about um, leaf removal? Uh, is that an issue in these lanes? And do you have any a similar kind of a program? 
though I yeah have, I mean it does seven feet of leaves yeah so. like you you do get leaves in the fall uh and it's just a thing that happens and so we have weekly street cleaning um that goes basically until the snow starts and so sometimes you get a little bit of still leaves on the ground and then the snow happens and that sort of makes it a little slick um, but yeah, there's a city program of every street is cleaned uh, weekly, and so they just have um, street cleaners, which is just like they have the sort of hard plastic bristles that rotate um, around that go along the edge of the street, and it just sucks it up, they blow some water onto it, it gets it moving, and then they suck it up and then dump it, and I think most of it, they try to compost it, but of course people leave other material in there so that makes it a little bit harder but that's been going on as long as I can remember living here so so is, is there a small version for the bike lanes um yeah yeah they okay. have these mini versions and they can also use that on the sidewalk as well depending on the okay. size of the sidewalk they also have these like shop vacuum the shop vac machines that sort of suck up um, with a vacuum but yeah they have ones for the street and they have ones for bike lanes and it's just okay. like you know if you only had one bike lane you might not be useful to invest in it um, but once you have a lot you know you can't just sort of leave it there so that's part of your maintenance contract your maintenance budget and you just have to build that in but you know more bike lane you know widths of the street mean you have less width to do the car stuff so it's sort of not doesn't completely balance out but it does a fair bit Great. Um, so there are a lot of questions related to sort of this mode shift, and I think you got at some of them um, towards the end where, if I were interpreting, you were making a case that there's still the same number of users on the street. It's just shifted from motor vehicles to mm -hmm. actually bicycles. Um, but the question is always going to come up, well, did the cars go to other corridors? Did the city do any analysis to see if any of that was happening or were there com complaints or any? Um, yeah, so looking at those two, like we didn't have car counters on those two other streets, but the city does do car counts um, on, on the other similar street. And there was a small increase if I remember, but it was fairly minor, like it was 2% or something like that. So sort of within the margin of error, um, you know, obviously some of the people who are driving for are going to, you know, drive on other streets, um, but it's a very dense city and there was always a lot of traffic um, issues. So there wasn't a ton of space for them to go. So, you know, we can't be sure what every user did. And certainly some people did move to other corridors, but for the most part, we think, you know, a lot of people either change, uh, change mode, like as I mentioned, there's a metro line running right under the street. Um, so that's a great way to access that street or get into downtown, um, you know, or, or did change modes in, into biking. Uh, another thing, of course, is that you might expect that like a lot fewer people were going into downtown because the post was during the pandemic and just downtown hasn't fully recovered and this is one way people would get into it so you know a lot of that car decrease I think is just like people said I don't need to go downtown I can work remotely um, but as you saw like in some times the cars actually increase the number of cars per hour during the weekends um, so it was more sort of a leveling out um, but I would say that like when they looked at uh, and then when we looked at the data that existed for the adjacent streets, um, we didn't see any more than just a rounding error of an increase on other streets. So. Great, thank you. And how are truck deliveries handled? Are there designated parking areas for trucks? Um, um, I, think trucks? There, I think there are a few. So there is parking. There were before. So there are loading zones and those are on the street. And because the parking lane um, I can probably go and find some of those photos, but because the parking was maintained on the streets, um, then here's a good one, right? So you have the, these parking lanes uh, there on the street, they weren't taken away. So yes, residents and businesses and, and people going there could still park, but you see these sort of large area and there are some some of those loading zones so any of the loading zones that were there before i'm not going to say every single one was maintained but they were generally maintained they're still there and you know that's just a decision of like when do you want to allow that and so on um 
you know, and one of the things, of course, you know, you can do, you can do hourly stuff. Um, at the beginning, there was that photo of the pedestrianized street. And so trucks were allowed in between, I think, 7 and 11 a.m. or something like that. So, you know, if you work it out with businesses that when the deliveries can happen and so on, um, you know, when customers are less likely to come, then the car spots are not going to be used as much. The pedestrian streets aren't going to be used. So you can have that loading happen during that time and then convert those into car parking spaces at other times of the day. And that worked reasonably well, like bef well before this was in the case. Um, there are like time of day loading zones only, and I think it has been just as successful before. So managing curbside management is definitely an important thing of how you think about how you're gonna use that street. Great, thanks. And um, did you look, or was there any increase in transit ridership, either the Metro or the bus after the changes? Mm -hmm. Did you look at um, We did not look at that specifically, but I do know that transit ridership, I think we just hit like 60% of the pre-pandemic level. Um, so I would guess that there is a strong decrease um, and that is throughout the entire network. Um, I did not, it's sort of hard to tell because you don't have in and out data for that because you only you tap your card when you get on the bus or when you get on the metro. Um, and so seeing where people are going, like you can see somewhat of like the stations that are nearby there. Um, but I, I would say that is a little bit more complex to look at. I personally, I would guess that the pandemic was just such a large thing that it would cause a rounding error. Um, but I, I would assume that like there are definitely the case that I know that people who are going to the street who did not go before, um, myself included, um, and some of those people are definitely coming via transit because it is so accessible to transit because there are all these metro stations nearby. So I would assume the number of people going to the street who use transit has probably increased um, relative to everywhere else, given the realities of the pandemic. Um, but those we did not look at those numbers specifically okay great well how about this what about safety there's a couple of questions about safety performance um and i don't know if there's been enough time um but do you know if there's been any data about um yeah along either head bike um, yeah i would or, say that in general montreal has done well i know there was like nationally like in both the us and canada an increase um, an increase uh and specifically in the us in the number of crashes during the pandemic because you had people driving faster because there were fewer people on the road so it was easier to go fast when there are not many people around um and so you did see that increase in pedestrian bicycle deaths and injuries and so um that did not really happen in Montreal. We've had a bit of a steady decrease and it has gone down. It is not as low as I wished it was, um, you know, but it, it has definitely gone down. The corridor in particular, I have not seen data on that, um, but I would expect with, you know, because it's not just this one street where they're doing this, they've done multiple streets and they're building up that whole network. And then as well, they're building out you know, like all other bike lanes that are not necessarily this wide for smaller streets. Um, we've just seen an overall decrease in pedestrian and bicycle fatalities and injuries, even though the number of people using those modes have increased. So I would assume it's going to be similar for this corridor. But again, I don't have specific data for that. Um, and I would say that we have done studies where we have compared crash data to count data to try to normalize that. Um, we've done that in Quebec City and Vancouver, Canada. Um, so that that is also an interesting way to look at it if you, you can look at and see which are the most dangerous corridors per capita of usage. Um, so that would be an interesting follow up for sure. Great. Um, I have a question here about sort of the, the data itself and the counters, and I'm going to ask you to maybe try to avoid turning this into a sales pitch for EcoCounter, but sure. um, if you could talk generally about sort of how, um, like, are there any manual counts and then, or is this all through the EcoCounters and then maybe generally how you validate um automatic counters yeah um so i would say that in generally 
the the manual accounts where you send some people out to do that um when i lived in richmond virginia i volunteered and did that you know you stand for two hours and do the counts and they're okay um but i remember talking to some people from track and they were like well you know they're they're not that great because you really get such a short amount of time and they're like you really need a week of data um to be able to 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 get good ideas of what's going on in a corridor and to be able to to extrapolate that to other times um and also you know you do want to try to get that manual validation and i think i think they mentioned the track that sort of the gold standard is have a video camera watch it and then you know just well, get some students to do it and uh, they'll do it on the cheap. Um, you know, try to find grad grad students or undergrads is always the, the solution to heavy resource intensive problems, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, do that and then compare it to the automatic accounts. And, you know, there have been some studies um, with our account data and, and others as well, and they're fairly accurate in the 90s usually. Um, but, you know, the manual accounts are important to make sure that like, yes, this actually just fit. Yes, it's working properly and so on. Um, and then, you know, I think afterwards that kind of validation can be done, but you can also sort of do validation between multiple automatic headers. Like, as I said, it's very seasonally um, adjusted. A lot of the data it really does vary per season. But when you have a similar facility a mile or two apart, you're often going to get similar kinds of data if it's the kind of same facility. So one of the webinars I know that one of my colleagues did um, for I think it was the League of American Bicyclists, and they mentioned that you know like if you have a trail and if you have an on-street protected bike lane, your profile is going to be different, and so you're going to get different number of cyclists at different times, right? So comparing the data that you got on a trail from a temporary account you as if you can as best as you can you want to try to compare that to either that same trail or a different trail in the same area so you have the same kind of profile of recreational versus commuting use and going to local businesses and local versus more regional travel um so there's a lot of stuff that can be done and there's there's fun stats that that are interesting and boring at the same time um but you know, th there are definitely ways to do that. And you just have to make sure that you have enough good comparisons and that you think about it, right? And that is the thing that like, again, I'm not gonna sales pitch, but that's the thing our team does, but as the team researchers do as well, they're starting to become best practices. And I think there's, there's more interesting research to do on that. Um, but there's a surprising a lot that you can sort of estimate with a small amount of counts, but it has to be more than just you know, a few hours here and there. You, you really do need about a week or so to get good data. Right. Um, so we have some remaining questions that um, relate to the, the, the design of the street. And I'll go ahead and ask them, but acknowledging that you weren't the person who designed the street, um, but um, do the best you can or pass. Um, yeah. And one has to do with were there any special design considerations for the bus service to accommodate passengers? And you mentioned that the bus doesn't run very, very frequently, but how infrequent is it? Hourly, half hourly? Um, yeah, so for, for Montreal, th every 30 minutes or so is very infrequently. And this bus is actually the, mainly the reason it's there is because our metro is not fully accessible yet. It's only about a third of stations are. And so there are a number of bus routes to parallel metro lines. That bus will probably go away whenever we get to 100%. Um, but I don't, there are some treatments on this street and we've seen them more in other cities too. So when they were really rebuilding the street, they would build little um, islands um, like the islands that you saw. And I can, I can go back through, um, but instead of filling them with grass like this, um, they would just make it concrete and then they would put the bus stop there. And then on the bike lane, they would raise up the bike lane. So it was equal to the level of the sidewalk and the island. And so you have that floating island bus stop and the pedestrian would cross into it. So I think actually, yeah, you can see in this photo. So over here above this person's head is a little bus stop. And then here is the pocket where the bus will pull into um, right after the intersection. And then there is a uh, concrete island there. It's not huge. I think also usually the bike lane narrows a little bit right there, depending on the space constraints. Um, and so, yeah, that's where, that's what you would do. Um, we're seeing this more and more when there are bike lanes. Um, they build some with concrete, some of them they put like 
more temporary kinds of things. I'm not sure exactly where they bought them, but I have them seen them around. Um, some with rubber, some with metal, so that drainage can go through and so on. Um, but that has generally been what they have decided is the safest thing, is not to have people, not to have the bus turn into the bike lane and then come out and block it and have this hopping back and forth. Because um, you often see like bikes and buses have about the same average speed, but bikes are sort of consistently like 10 miles an hour and buses are like 20 miles and then zero miles an hour. And so you get this hopping effect, which is not safe or fun for anyone. So this kind of separate and make it so that the conflict is only people crossing over the bike lane when they're walking um, it is, I think, personally, the way to go. And I think that the city made the right call on that. And that's what they're doing more and more. Great. I see we are at one o'clock. Um, there were a couple remaining questions. I apologize to those of you. Um, they were they did have to do with the design of the street, and I'm not sure um, if you would have had quite the details, but we'll share them with you, Nicholas. But I am going um, to go back and wrap things uh, sorry, there we go. Um, so first of all, thank you so much, Nicholas. Um, I'm teaching a quantitative analysis class right now for my planning students, and, and you've done a lovely job of um, giving some great examples of using data to analyze and answer questions, um, and we really appreciate it. And to all of you who have been watching, thank you for joining us. And um, after the seminar ends, you'll have an opportunity to complete a very brief survey um, about today's um, event. And it only takes a minute or two. And we really do appreciate your feedback. We do pay attention to it. And with that, um, again, I'll thank Nicholas Smith from EcoCounter for spending time with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. Excellent.